We both found out that we're both in Georgia. We're both in Atlanta at the time, and we connect on there, and we're like, hey, we should meet up. And we go on a date while I'm filming Clint's movie. We went to a place called, um, why am I forgetting the name? We decided to meet at a restaurant called Beulah. Beulah, thank you. Our first date was at a place called Beulah in Atlanta, and we got some tapas food. I walk in like dressed up, I had driven four hours dressed up. And I remember I showed up to the date dressed like trash, like I looked like a drug dealer. I was wearing like a Macho Man Randy Savage t-shirt and baggy board shorts. He was there before me, I was late, which is still consistent to this day. I looked like a guy that owned a dispensary. You knew that he was a good person and he had a really good heart. And if you're in the dating world, you know that's really hard to find. So there was some of that going on where I didn't put my best foot forward when I met her, but I was still myself. I was still uh, Paul. He was just so sweet and so kind and just had this gentle spirit that I just fell in love with. We had a very good time. And we talked about how much we loved our families. We talked about how much we loved our siblings and our close relationship. We talked about God and just generosity to people. And we went to see The Lion King, the live action uh, version and she was attracted to some of that, apparently. I took him back to where he was staying. I I was so inundated with my job at the time, uh, starring in a $40 million Clint Eastwood biopic. It was funny, too. She invited me to church, not as like a date thing, but I kind of took it as like, is our second date going to be at church? I don't know if I want it to be at a church. I don't know if I can make out with her in church. So I was like, I I think think I'm going to wait till (laughs) we get to L.A. I knew he was busy, and I was busy, and I was like, I don't know how this is going to work. So he went to go film Cruella in London, and I was going down to South Georgia to film a movie. January hits, there's talk of a pandemic, and we're like, what is COVID-19? And I remember there was a stay-at-home order by the city of Los Angeles. So we just started texting, and then... Of course, we're on lockdown, and he said, do you want to break the law? Meaning you want to you want to hang out? And I was like, um, yeah, let's do that. Let's hang out. There it is. Hey, side cam, how you doing? Finger gun. We reconnected during the pandemic in 2020. We had already planned to meet up anyway. It wasn't like uh, a lack of options. And uh, it became easier to meet up when our lives were totally put on pause. And we talked about our families, and we watched... Pearl Harbor, the Michael Bay classic. Which is one of my all-time favorite movies. I don't care how cheesy anybody says it is. And um, we really bonded very quickly. There was just this, like, feeling of, like, I'm so comfortable with you and I want to hang out with you forever, but you can't, like, say that on a second date. Why does this feel so easy? Why does this feel so seamless? Why do we align on so many things that matter? And why do we both feel like we finally found the thing we were looking for? The more that we're talking, the more that who we are aligned together. And he was so kind, and he was thoughtful, and he was ambitious and driven, and he had dreams, wanted to be in the will of God. And I was just like, wow, like, God, you were so good. You you were so kind. Like, the fact that she felt that way about me at that time in 2020, where I was in my health journey and spiritual journey, who I was as a man, like— homegirl has got lots of grace uh, that she fell in love with that guy. It wasn't that I wasn't like a nice guy. It was that I was also alarmingly immature, not fully self-aware at all, selfish in how I commodified my time. She met me at the age of 33, and I was really much closer to like a a, a 20, 21-year-old. And we did balance each other out. I think that, you know, I could help give her focus when she didn't have it. She could help speak truth to me when I would kind of be inundated with lies and doubt. It was so many amazing moments and affirmations and and convicted feelings that I was just like, we should probably meet each other's families this summer and like move forward with this. We went down to my hometown so he could meet my family in Georgia. And while we were there in my childhood bedroom, he asked me to marry him. And 
it it was just really sweet. It was just like, okay, the rest of my life begins. Like, I'm finally getting to be a wife, and hopefully I'll soon be a mom. So we were like, you know what? Let's just, like, we know we want to be married. We know we want to, let's just do this thing. I think that, like, sent off alarm signals, and friends and family were just like, wow, you're getting married very soon. But, you know, all along, like, it was funny. All these people were telling me, like, my grandparents got married after two weeks, and he got out of the military, and they were together for 62 years. And you're just like, oh, like, like this is perception and reality at war per usual. Uh, some people's perception was negative about how Amy and I were getting together. And then the reality was is everything was literally fine. We were doing so well. We got married on my front lawn of a house that I was renting uh, with a handful of friends. Then we got to do like a little mini honeymoon in Santa Barbara. We got married and got pregnant within two weeks of our marriage. And that was intentional. And we get back from our honeymoon and there's become some tension. Something happened where Amy and my family were not getting along and while I was still showing up for Amy and I'm doing all this stuff, I'm also heavily medicated. Paul felt like he was being torn um, between his family and me. And I'm drinking wine and old fashions at night and tequila and I'm taking edibles and suddenly, you know, I'm high during the day and she doesn't know it. There was a lot of over-medicating and a lot of tribalistic feelings about my family where I, I didn't really leave and cleave the way the Bible talks about it. I definitely had an unhealthy allegiance to um, my family. He got a phone call from his brother and then he looked at me and he was like, I need to go. I was crying and I was like, okay, like, we just need to talk, we just need to have a conversation. And rather than try to like work on that problem between her and my family, I separated from her after two months of marriage while she was still pregnant. And I just broke down outside the post office in my car and I was just yelling at the enemy and I was like, you cannot have my family. You don't get to have my family. Like, what the f 